Good afternoon. <laughs> um, the aim of my petition is to bring to the committee's attention the current situation regarding my first baby, um, who was born in Spain on the 3rd of December 1992. I'm British. The father of my baby was British. So as the first petitioner stated, this is something that crosses frontiers. I'm proof of that. I'm a mother looking for the truth. Um, my baby was born, as I said, in December 1992. That's not that long ago. This year, my baby, if alive, would be 23. My pregnancy was perfect, and the baby was very healthy when she was born. The labour was induced, it was rather controlled, and after more than 16 hours in labour, the doctors decided to give me a caesarean under general anaesthetic which my baby was born at 1.20 in the morning. Because of the general anaesthetic, I didn't start to wake up till half past six in the morning. I didn't even see my baby that I'd carried for nine months. The following day, my husband had to tell me the bad news, that my baby had died, inexplicably. In the words of the doctors, it was unexplained. The, despite numerous requests, we were not permitted to see my baby once she'd passed away. This has always left a vacuum in my life. I've never seen my baby that I carried. I grieved for 19 and a half years, to a greater or lesser extent. But in February 2012, the situation in Spain was brought to my attention by a visit from a friend, a Spanish friend, who knew I was living back in the UK and thought I wouldn't, wouldn't know of the scandal that was breaking in Spain. She was right, I didn't know. But when she started to tell me about cases in the news, because every time she heard them, she thought, that's exactly what happened to Ruth. When she was t describing them, she was describing cases from the 1960s. And I could have identified so much with them. You could have changed the name. It was, my, it was exactly what happened to me. Medicine moves on. How can a birth 30 years later be the same? So after this, when I discovered my new situation, I had to learn to live with the unknown. Living in, with the unknown is extremely hard. In some ways, it was easier when I was grieving because I knew what I was dealing with. I could put flowers. I, I, I could remember the pregnancy at least but once the doubts were there I couldn't do that anymore it was like my life was a jigsaw that had been picked up and dropped and nothing fitted so then I, I the next day I looked at things that I'd kept from the pregnancy first thing I saw was the license to have her buried was was blank it wasn't filled in so obviously this rang alarm bells in my head I went to my local police in North Yorkshire, in the UK. I reported it as a crime there and put things into motion. My local police force did a lot of work to, to try and help to get an investigation started. It was referred to Scotland Yard that passed it on to Interpol. Interpol's investigation lasted three weeks. I was totally shocked when I heard that the investigation was over. It was an investigation that had been based solely on a hospital report provided by the hospital itself that the allegations were against. Nobody was interviewed, not even myself. But however, Interpol in Madrid decided this was enough evidence to say there was no crime. Um, I received a copy of this hospital report that was 107 pages long. I did a report on the, re on the report myself, without medical knowledge, but just going over discrepancies, things that didn't add up. In my report, there was over 150 concerns and discrepancies that were passed back to Interpol in Madrid, but never followed up. An example of this, in the hospital report, there were four different times of death. My, according to this report, my baby had died at 10 to 2, 20 past 2, 3 o'clock, 20 past 3 in the morning.
I cannot explain that. I cannot explain why Interpol didn't pick up on that. In more than three years now, not one of my questions has been answered. Not one. How is it so difficult for the authorities to demonstrate my baby died? It should be easy. The police, police response, in my opinion, was inconclusive, to say the least. The outcome of the investigation consisted of a memo from the police that quoted verbatim from a hospital document, which was the autopsy report, which the validity of this report was never checked. But Interpol in Madrid accepted what it said. At the moment, my case is with the court in La Coruña, closed. It has been closed since September last year. I have no idea when my appeal that is, is pending will be resolved. I've been waiting 12 months and there is, there is nothing in sight. My case has been closed three times now. Each time my case is closed quicker and then it takes longer to get reopened. Each time I have three, day, three days to appeal the court's decision, which has, uh, it causes great difficulties, especially living in another country. But we, so we do that, we manage. The UK authorities, and I believe the Commission's response, has been to simply direct me to various voluntary platforms in Spain that have no legal status I don't dispute that they serve a purpose, but they don't really help me in the UK. Yeah. And it, how is it possible that this is the only resource available for such a serious crime? It is important to shine a light, not only on my case, but all those in Spain. I believe that there are approximately 1,500 reported crimes of babies being taken at birth. And to get, we need to get the answers for our families and to get justice. I want to hear from other European citizens if they have lost their baby, if they've lost their baby too. But I think it's time we stop talking about losing babies. I didn't lose my baby. I wasn't that careless. My baby was taken from me and I was told my baby had died. So I was even robbed of the chance of looking for my baby because nobody looks for a dead baby. So I'm appealing to the, commission, to the committee to get some answers, or at least to support myself and all these other cases, because living with this, with no end in sight, is so difficult, not only for me, but for my other children. It takes a lot of put an incredible amount of time. Time that my other children need their mother too. I, I, the other point that I think was raised was many of the peoples who can provide the answers to the questions are aging. They're getting older. These delays in investigations to me is simply unacceptable because once those people are no longer with us, the answers have gone. Thank you very much. And I thank you very much on behalf of the committee. And really, I must admire the courage to travel all the way here and, and, and share with you. Open up your heart like this. I mean, this is too moving to all of us, really. Even though it's terribly difficult to find a, a constructive way forward, but our, our sympathy and our compassion is there with you, with all of you. Mrs. Curtin Darling is first. Thank you um, very much. Um, I was absolutely horrified when I read these petitions and when I read the testimonies of the parents um, involved. And, um, and I was particularly horrified by the fact that the, it seemed to me that the lack of proper investigation of many of these cases is a a form of secondary torture on parents in a sense because it prolongs as Ruth has said prolongs that 
pain of um, of loss and the and the unknown of of what's happened, um, and and therefore um, I I feel quite obliged to say that I think we have to do more than the Commission proposes in their recommendations, <laughs> partly because um, as I'm sitting in the Petitions Committee now for since the European elections, there have been cases that we've kept open where it's been retroactively linked to the Charter of Fundamental Rights and we felt that um, this committee was the uh, place of last resort for people who needed recourse because there hadn't been fair recourse through other means. And I think this is a case of, of that kind of a situation. Um, I think there are European dimensions, the fact that we have um, parents from other countries um, who are affected, um, a child, effectively a British citizen taken in a Spanish hospital creates a transnational issue um, in my eyes. It's a criminal question. Certainly the Commission can't handle a criminal question and I accept, um, I accept that. But I think as, um, as we wouldn't ignore questions about trafficking, of adults and of young people, we shouldn't ignore questions about trafficking of, of very small people as well. Um, the other element that I think is very important is that um, I think it's quite unbelievable that the victims um, have had to shoulder the burden of proof to demonstrate that their children are still alive um, against this wall of, of silence and, and improper investigations. And I think it's important to put that on record. I, I as well really commend people who've had the courage to come to the European Parliament and to explain what's happened to them. I think it's, um, it's extremely courageous and that should be recognised. And so I have a, a couple of suggestions of what I think we could do as a means of offering solidarity uh, to these parents. And I think one thing that we could do is to write to the uh, Spanish minister with um, the petitions that we've received in Annex asking for proper investigations into these cases. Um, certainly as a, as a British MEP, um, that's what the British MEPs will be doing in relation to Ruth Appleby's case, um, that we will be asking um, uh, questions of um, the, the Spanish government about the way that this has been investigated. I think we've just established today a working group on children's rights, and, and there are some questions which could be um, asked of that working group to investigate if there aren't further activities, uh, further actions which are, are possible to support these parents. Um, because um, I'm very aware that the Petitions Committee is very rarely the first choice for people who have a problem. It's always the place of last resort. And um, I think you know, the scale of this and the fact that so much is unknown and we don't know how many other victims might be in other countries across Europe. Um, we know of, of Ruth in the UK, there are other people in the UK who don't necessarily want to speak in public. There may be victims in other countries as well. These, um, uh, dis the disappearances or however you want to describe them have taken place in relatively recent years. Um, the early 90s as an example and I, I just feel that uh, we have a responsibility to show um, and to, to take up their cases and to, and to press um, the Spanish government for proper investigations and for proper answers so that that torture for these parents doesn't continue longer than is necessary. <laughs>